one in four women experience depression compared to one in 10 men. 29% of black women have a common mental disorder compared to 21% of white British women and 16% of white other women. Three quarters of mental health issues are established before the age of 24. pharmacy student in my fourth and final year um, and I was also the general secretary of the ACS 2018-2019. So what is your diagnosis and how did you adjust to life with your mental illness? My diagnosis is depression with mild anxiety um, and I was also diagnosed with narcolepsy which isn't a mental illness in and of itself but it affects my mental health a lot. Um, how did I adjust? I guess, do you mean like after my diagnosis? It's weird because obviously just by being diagnosed the depression doesn't go away, do you know what I mean? But it gave me like clarity because after being diagnosed, it was like, oh, okay, so you weren't going crazy. This is a real thing. And there's help available. So I guess um, after being diagnosed, it was a, it was like there was light at the end of the tunnel. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, telling my friends and family. Um, family, bit of a sticky one. Um, obviously, man's black. I don't know if you can tell. But I grew up in an African household, so mental health, emotions, wasn't really a thing like that. Um, so I did put off telling my family for a while. My friends, on the other hand, they were very, um, what's the word? Very considerate, very sympathetic. Um, and they were really helpful in my recovery journey. What are the stigmas attached to your mental illness? And if... If so, does these stigmas affect the way you look at your illness or yourself? Mm. I think um, stigma, mm. obviously, like I said before, I grew up in an African household. Um, and it's very like, um, it used to be, I would say, a bit of a taboo thing, mental health. Um, and the stigma that was attached to it, it was, it was a lot like, like I had something to be ashamed of um, because I was supposed to feel one way and I wasn't feeling that way so I, I kind of felt like I was broken or there was something wrong with me um, and I guess Yeah. Um, so in terms of the way um, it affected how I looked at myself, um, I used to see myself as this um, broken thing um, that was beyond repair sort of thing. Um, and it was very overwhelming, you know, um, to look at yourself in the mirror and wonder why why is this happening to me when is this going to end that sort of thing um and it was a very um the way i viewed it was a very um what you call it it was a long-term something as in i thought that i was never gonna overcome it I can't think i can't remember the word but yeah yeah in terms of medication like what medication are you on or where you on and like how did you like adjust life because i know the side effects can be quite they can be quite difficult so how did you deal with that so um currently i'm gonna try and use patient friendly language before i slip, slip into my pharmacy mode um i take sertraline which is an antidepressant um i'm on 150 milligrams which is the second 
highest dose. Um, that's for my depression. I also take um, a medication called modafinil, um, which is for my narcolepsy. It helps me to stay awake during the day. Um, and I'm also on propanolol, which is a beta blocker, um, and it helps me um, when I have panic attacks um, because of the anxiety. Um, it helps to slow down my heartbeat, which calms the rest of my body down. Um, in terms of adjusting to them, the sertraline was definitely the most difficult to adjust to um, because the way antidepressants work, um, when you first start taking them, there's a dip in your mood. Um, and so it's easy for a lot of people to think when they start taking it or that it's not working or um, they're having a, like, a bad reaction to it because why are they feeling worse than they were before they started taking it. But it does take a while to work. But when it starts working, you'll soon begin to see that, oh, okay, this is the way it was supposed to. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. How, how is life currently living with your diagnosis and how has it shaped you as an individual? How has it shaped me? Um, life right now is, is calm in it. It's all right. Um, obviously, the stresses of life. I'm still a student, so life is hard. But um, on the back of my diagnosis, um, like I said earlier, getting that diagnosis um, made me realise that help is available. And so when I sought that help, everything became much easier. Um, the GP was there. I went to therapy. I went to counselling. Um, and then obviously the medication as well. Um, so since my diagnosis... I've had good days and bad days, but now that, now that, well, let me restart the sentence. I've had good days and bad days, but even on my bad days, I know that they're not going to last forever. And that there's, there's a way out. Yeah. Um, it's definitely changed the way I interact with other people as well, because I know that now, when I see someone and they're moving a bit mad or or they're rude or like for example I was at Lidl the other day and the, the checkout lady was, was was moving a bit mad. She was she was a bit cheeky. Um she was on the phone, she was talking to a colleague, I was trying to scan my things and she was she was just being very um and the old me would have been like, Oi, like you have a customer like what you did. Um but these days I always have at the back of my mind like I don't know what someone else is going through. Um, and I don't know that they might have had a bad day, they might have had some bad news. Um, so I always take that into account when I interact with others. And I try not to um, use their behaviour as a, as a way to um, determine their character. Um, but rather, the way I interact with them and the way I react to their behaviour is more so a testament to my character. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Okay, what about, let's talk about pre-diagnosis. How, mm. how was that? Because I know, because you wasn't on medication. Mm. How was like a, a day for you, like with your, before you knew that, that you had like the depression before drops, have you said yeah. Mm. When it was bad, it was bad. How bad? Like, I mean, how much time do we have? I mean, <laughs> it was, it was a lot. Um, a day in the life of Arike before her diagnosis, um, I would wake up 2pm maybe, um, I would open my eyes, but was I awake? Do you know what I mean? I was, it was a, every day was a blur, everything was just fusing together. I would go through the motions, I would go to uni, I would go to church, um, I would go to the shops. But sometimes I felt like my body was moving, but I wasn't there. I wasn't present in anything. Um, and those were the days that I actually got out of bed. Most days, I would, my eyes would open, like I said, and I would just stay in bed. I wouldn't go on my phone, I wouldn't brush my teeth, I wouldn't shower for days on end. Um, yeah. I was smelly. I was stinking. My breath was stinking. Was like, we have to thank God for the little bits here. Um, yeah, and it was just, it was like that for a, a few, a few months, yeah. So when did you know you needed help? When was the point where it got to a breaking point and you're like, yeah, I need to get help? 
I thought that you know this is this was uni this is just life everybody's probably going through it but it was actually a friend who pointed out to me that Arika you're not okay you need to go see your doctor um she came to see me like I said I was thinking my room was a mess um she was like are you okay I'm like yeah I'm like you know just in it that's all right in it um she was like I'm worried about you please seek help um, I thank God for her every day because if not for her, then I would probably still be in that room stinking. Yeah, man. So what was your coping mechanism with your depression? Like, what was a way to either, like, help you to feel better for, even if it's just for, like, an hour? Food. I like to eat. I like to cook. You guys should follow me on Instagram for all these recipes. Um, no, I'm joking. Um... Yeah, but like I said, there were days that I couldn't get out of bed. So obviously when that wasn't an option, um, I would like to say, so obviously I'm a Christian. I would like to say that, you know, I would talk to God and God was always there for me. And just, uh, but no, <laughs> no, because I felt in those moments, I felt so alone. I felt like it was just me, myself and I in this cold, dark world. I was crying out to God and he wasn't listening. That's what I felt like anyway. Obviously he was, but that's what I felt like. Um, and it was very like overwhelming the emotions that I was experiencing and so when I was like crying out to God and I and I thought he wasn't listening I kind of like gave up on my faith um looking back on it now my faith was definitely a coping mechanism um because even the fact that I was able to express myself to God that in itself made me feel a little bit better even though I felt like my prayers weren't doing anything. It was doing something in my spirit. So we thank God for that. Um, thank God. Yeah. Also, how was it getting help? Because at times, especially in university, the GP can sometimes just say, it's just a stage at university. Mm -hmm. You'll get over it. No, 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 no. Um, whenever you visit the GP, this is like general advice as well. If you visit the GP with a complaint and they refuse to treat you, make sure you get them to write it down in there in your records because if you go and see a GP another GP the next day um, and they do diagnose you with something they'll see that that GP didn't do anything and then they'll get fired no I'm joking not that extreme but make sure they note it down for future reference in terms of getting help um, when you see your GP let them know how you feel um, and I won't lie most of the time they probably will say Oh, it's just you need to see how you feel in a couple of weeks. Because more time, it that can be the case. So it's not that they're dismissing you. It's just that they're trying to present all the options before they go to the extremes of, um, okay, let's get you into therapy. Let's get you on medication. So they're trying to rule out all the possible things that could be. Um, it's not that they don't want to help you. Well, it is very difficult to get help, though, I will say. Um, yeah, especially in this panoramic. Um, because of the, um, the, a lot of GPs are burdened at the moment, so yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. What advice would you give to people that are currently struggling? Because a lot of people do find it difficult opening up because they feel like they really not feel hurt, um, hurt by other people, mm -hmm. or they may feel like what they're going through, other people are going through it, so it's not, it's not like. Oh, I, um, yeah, I had that problem quite a lot. Um, First and foremost, I would say, if you're a Christian, pray. Um, whatever faith you belong to, pray. Um, because like I said, even just expressing myself was very, very helpful. Um, secondly, I would say, there's definitely resources available. Whether or not you wanna, um, you wanna, you don't wanna talk to a friend, you don't wanna talk to your family, um, there are loads of like anonymous helplines, um, anonymous services you can use. The uni has one. Um, it's called Nightline. Um, they operate in the night, obviously. Um, and you call them and you just talk. And they don't, they don't give you advice. They don't tell you what to do. They just listen to you. Which I think is also very helpful. Um, and I would also encourage people to... Even if you feel like you're a burden on your friends, I would definitely encourage you to still mention something, even if it's like 
a sentence, oh, I'm not feeling too great. Um, you don't necessarily have to like off offload everything onto them, but even them just acknowledging the fact that you're not doing okay, that can give them like um, an invitation to to help you out, whether it's like with grocery shopping or um, praying for you, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, it's easier said than done. I know it's easier said than done, but um, making sure you surround yourself with loving, caring people will definitely make it easier. Yeah. So, okay, you said that you suffer with narcolepsy, mm -hmm. and like with that, do you mind explaining a bit more about it and like what you go through? Yeah. So, um, long story short, narcolepsy is a neurological disorder. Um, that affects my sleep-wake cycles. So, um, as I'm standing here before you, I'm awake, but sometimes my brain might think I'm getting ready for bed. Um, so, things that you typically do when you're in bed, so like sleeping, dreaming, that sort of thing, um, I might do during the day. And what that means is, like, for example, when I'm walking down the road, um, my body might um, shut down, I guess, um, because it thinks I'm asleep, so um, sometimes my neck, um, I lose like muscle tone in my neck and then my neck will flop like this, or my legs will like, you know, form, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, um, so like I said, um, dreaming is something you usually do when you sleep, so sometimes I, I dream while I'm awake in the form of like hallucinations. Um, and it also means like I'm just really tired all the time. When you sp so you said about the hallucinations, do you mind going into detail about the experiences yeah. you've gone through? Um, they come and go. Um, sometimes I'll be um, doing some work and I'll hear someone say my name. And I know I'm alone in my room, but it'll make me just like, oh, what was that? You know? um, they usually happen, so like as, as I said, um, Sometimes when I'm awake, my body thinks I'm asleep. So um, let's say I've just woken up from a nap. Um, I'm now entering like the awake phase, but my, bro my body will still think that I'm dreaming. So in that little period of time between waking up, between sleeping and waking up, sorry, um, that's when the hallucinations come um, the most. So sometimes it'll be like, like I said, someone calling my name or sometimes it'll, it'll be like I'm in a marketplace. You know when you're in a market and they're like, come and get your strawberries, come and get your bananas, two for one, two, that sort of thing. Um, I'll hear like the, the bustle of a market and I know I'm in my bed. Um, uh, sometimes, so that's like aud aud auditory. Um, sometimes I'll see things. So um, recently I was waking up, like I said, um, and... I saw two men enter my room. Jesus, God forbid. Hey, sorry. It's fine, it's fine. Sorry. sorry. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Sorry. Sorry, just, the, it, was, it was scary. Obviously, it's scary when, when you see things like that. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I saw two men enter my room. I just said, blood of Jesus, and then they disappeared. So we thank God for that. But, um, <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, or sometimes like I'll feel a presence in my room, but like I said, I'm defo. I live in a studio, so I'm a, I'm alone in my room. Um, little things like that, you know. Um, but like I said, it usually happens um, as I'm entering sleep or as I'm waking up from sleep. So um, yeah, not like I've learned to live with it. There's no like sometimes the antidepressants help with the hallucinations um but more time i just like i find ways to like ignore them yeah. has the docs ever like said to you they might put you on antipsychotics mm. um well i expressed so i had an uh, uh, appointment with my sleep clinician um earlier this month and i told them about the hallucinations they said if it um gets to a point where i'm not able to manage them and I am now, so that's okay. Um, then antipsychotics is something is something they would consider. Yeah, but I'm not trying to be on too many medications. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did say that um, I, I, I'm putting that off for now. But yeah, it's an option. 
So how long were you on the search lean for? I've been on search lean for a year now. Oh my gosh, yeah, a year. It was a year this month because I started um, lockdown last year. Um, that's when I started taking them. So yeah, it's been a year. Yeah. Terry, um, I'm VP, um, I songwrite, um, it's not that deep, I also like to sing, um, man used to be a netballer in the spirit, <laughs> just like I was five foot eight in the spirit, but um, yeah, currently now I study law, and law, hmm, they're not joking when they say you can't allow life to chop you. You will chop life, and that is me in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, um, currently um, I have lovely parents, and I have um, a sister and a brother, and is it? Yeah. Describe what you have gone through with your mental health, and how did you adjust to life with it before and after? What is mental health? <laughs> it was non-existent. Sorry. Um, mental health, good, really good. Um, my mental health reached dangerous levels. Um, it definitely got to the point, instead of me being able to control it, it was controlling me. And, um, it really just distorted my reality and how I could be able to view the world. Um, my main source of things, like being able to do things and reach out to people, I'll just be negative, I'll doubt. Loads of seeds just made things very difficult that sometimes um, it was very easy to question why I'm here. And it made, it led me to um, make some decisions, but um, yeah, um, I'm not joking when I say that it's about God's grace that I'm still here today. Um, yeah, um, education wise, when things when I don't want to say episodes, but when things like that happen, there was it just made it so difficult for me to be able to do any work or do anything at all. There were just times where um, it would be difficult to get up. Normally, I will consider myself as a lazy person, but it's because I didn't really see the actual problem. I remember I came for like a long time. Like even from when I was in like secondary school, like I just didn't care. I didn't care about what I looked like. I didn't care about who I talked to, what people talked to me about because I didn't see worth in myself anymore. And it was just difficult for me to be able to continue. Like if people see me now, they'll say I'm a, like a happy person right now. But it's because I'm just, I've just been used and I've been accustomed to not show people what I go through because it's just seen as you being weak and yeah. So you spoke about um, having a mask, mm -hmm. like with others, but then back at, when you get home, you're yourself. So with that, I know there's a lot of stigmas attached to certain mental health issues. Can you go on to speak about yours, like the stigmas that you had, like the stigmas that you faced with yourself and like other people as well, telling you stuff as well. Mm -hmm. That could be family, friends. Mm -hmm. Stigmas, number one, if you have something attaining to mental illness, you're attention seeking. So if you do if you do raise a like raise a point about it, you consider it as attention seeking. Um people then view you instead of you being yourself, they view it as the mess or they view it as the mental health problem. Mm -hmm. Um stigmas sometimes I think it was lack of understanding that would cause um, difficulties in believing that mental illnesses could like be there and I think it was just down to the fact for example African household um, that's not necessarily considered as a thing but I think it's because if you think about it it's possible that um, from a very long period African parents themselves have also undergone it but because they didn't have the understanding and probably because of the way that people have been treated that they, they too haven't found a way to be able to cope with it so um, yeah, um, how do I cope with the stigmas? 
Um, I'm still coping with it. I mean, things that I am a strong believer that anything you can overcome. I'm still a strong believer in that one. And um, yeah, I'm just learning to understand that um, you are not your problems, you're not your scars, and you're not what people label you, label you as, essentially. I mean, I believe in God, so I believe that God is, I'm who God calls me to be and everything, but yeah. Okay, when did you know you needed help? I needed help? <laughs> um, <laughs> can you ask that question again? <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> when did you know that you were at a breaking point? Let me say that. Breaking so, point? Yeah, when you knew, yeah, I need to get help or I need to speak out. Um, last year, first year my birthday because one of the biggest game changes occurred on my birthday and I decided to um, make sure that I wasn't here on earth let's just say and um, it was the biggest thing because everything that I've gone through just accumulated and had resulted to that that day and I just remember that I was just thinking like I I technically should be dead and it was I think it was to the point where I realized that because normally I normally like to keep things to myself it was when I realized that there are people like to this day there's these two people that were there as well as my family after because my family had to come here for me but it's okay that doesn't matter but um there was two people in my life that helped me um, tough me and the family and they were there for me forever and I think knowing that um, I'm not a burden to people by talking about it is so helpful and it really helped me like try and see that help actually comes from actually reaching out and that um, also like, as much as I've talked about but it's also the idea that sometimes you can be comfortable in your sadness mm -hmm. and you can be comfortable where you are because you're scared or because you're used to so many bad things happening, you're just used to that nothing good happening. So therefore, you just come for what you really know of, and like the fear of not thinking that people are actually there for me and it seems a burden, is what you know helped me. But yeah. Okay. Um. Looking back now, how has what you've gone through shaped you as an individual? Because I feel like it shapes people. Sometimes the better, the worse. How do you think it shaped you as a person? Mm, definitely shaped me to be a stronger person. Um, it's helped me like realize that I should be proud of what I've gone through because there are things that people haven't necessarily experienced, but they're still trying to experience it. And the fact that you can still have the hope to be able to come out the other side is something that will push you and advance you in certain situations where people might be able to take it to heart but because of what I've gone through it can help other people mm. and I've just known that once you're able to break out of something you've opened the door for someone to be able to break in as well so you opening the door for somebody else's freedom is just as important and I think that also it says that God doesn't give you too much that you can handle mm. it's all to do with your mindset it's all to do with your mindset and one thing I've realized is that if you continue to you can't be negative and still believe in God at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't assume yourself to be able to move out and walk into the walk into the promises, walk into what you want to do if you still have the same old mindset because that old mindset will be able to understand the goodness and the possibilities that are beyond all understanding. So um yeah definitely um it's helped me understand that it all starts with the mind. Mm -hmm. Everything. And my mind is so much better than it was before. Okay, what strategies do you have for others to get out of like this dark place they're in? Like, what did you do when you were in a dark place? Um, two things. I won't say this. I'll say this one first. Um, the first one for me was to always find the root cause of what you've gone through. I think some things have triggered it, or some something stemmed down to something. So I think um, for me to be able to like go through the healing process. I went to I went I took time to go back even though I didn't want to there was some times where you know God will force me to go back to where things have triggered me I'll go back to it and I'll see how things have affected me um, word of affirmation um, word of affirmation was helpful 
but I think that's only it, it can only take you so far um, practical steps as well um, learning to love yourself because I've understood that if you can't love yourself then you're going to put yourself in a position where you won't necessarily be able to receive it nor will you be able to understand when love is being given to you mm -hmm. and also um, when you do love yourself you also know that um, love can withstand any burden so mm -hmm. even if you do part cast your burden onto other people because the love overcomes that you understand that that's that's all going to help you mm -hmm. so talk because you can't stay in one place and not be able to reach out because you're just going to stay there and I know for a fact that for you to for you to be able to overcome something, you need to take the first step. Mm -hmm. And that first step, whether it be talking, whether that first step, whether it actually realise it yourself, because some people don't even realise it themselves. I didn't realise it, to be honest. Number two, like I said, I'm Christian. And I think that, um, I know for me personally as well, that when I needed something so much, it always drew me back to God. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much that people can do for me that only God can heal because there's certain things that I can't go through like for example my how I've been hurt my heart my mind it says that I should guard my heart and there's certain things that I've let open and only for me personally God can heal and also like for example if I look at Job and Elijah they have been through the mentals of the mentals and I remember God like if even though like for example faith and faith and mental illness is always sometimes techie but it's because there's an assumption that if you're Christian you're no longer going to have these issues like it says that Paul had a thorn on his side. For me, my thorn has always been my mental problem. It's not saying that it can't necessarily go, but it's like God has equipped me with the grace to be able to overcome and still walk alongside with it. It's not denying that it cannot exist, but understanding and realizing that you actually have the power to either propel the power of the mental, the mental problem, or propel the things that can be able to help you move, move forward and overcome that. But um, yeah, that's basically it. How do you feel like mental health is received in the black community? Not very well. <laughs> um, I'll be real, but I think if everyone's improving, we are improving, I think we're understanding. And so shockingly, I won't be surprised that it's actually in the black community where most people are actually inflicted mm. with that kind of mental illness. And I think it's because of so long that we've always had to, we've felt the need to always hide and make ourselves strong in front of everything because of what we've gone through and everything. And I don't know, I think it's just, ugh, I don't know what it is. Obviously black doesn't crack, but sometimes black people can crack. We do crack. And it's in fact the cracks, the specific cracks that actually opens doors and makes you, there's actually beauty in cracks. And I don't know why we've, we have this idea that for every crack that we see, we always have to cement it. Mm -hmm. It's there for a reason. And instead of trying to fill it in, understand that it's part of the whole structure. And I think what the black community needs to do is that they need to understand that the whole structure, you're meant to be there to lift each other up. So I think it's more of understanding that we don't have to hide it. We just need to be there to be able to support it. So yeah. If you have been affected by any of these issues raised in this video, please do not hesitate to contact any of these helplines or contact the ACS.